At a time when wristwatches were starting to gain acceptance, Rolex changed the game by being the first billion-dollar empire to successfully produce a waterproof wristwatch. Rolex is one of the top luxury brands in the world, and today it's worth approximately $8 billion. It started over 100 years ago with Hans Filsdorf, an orphan who left everything behind and made his way to Switzerland, where he would rise above unfortunate events meant to break him and eventually build a multi-billion dollar empire. In this video, we'll be talking about how Rolex constantly broke boundaries and ultimately pioneered modern wristwatches. Hans Wilsdorf was born on the 22nd of March, 1881, in Kombach, Germany, to middle-class parents. Notably, he hails from a line of reasonably successful businessmen, beginning with his grandfather, who always specialized in iron goods. By 1892, Hans had lost both parents. The 12-year-old resented his uncle for selling the family business and using only a small fraction of it to put both him and his two siblings into a boarding school in Bavaria, Germany. Finding himself in a new school and in a new town, Hans found it challenging to adjust and became depressed. He found solace in his books and put all his efforts into his grades. He was brilliant at math and loved to study foreign languages. He knew he would one day start his business and travel the world, so he started preparing himself by learning French and English. He became friends with a Swiss boy who loved to tell stories about his hometown, Le Chard du Fond. This city in Switzerland was known for its watchmaking industry. Hans then developed an obsession with watches. After boarding school, he moved to Geneva, Switzerland. The 19-year-old got an apprentice job at an international pearl exporting company. One thing he learned during his time there was that the business was not manufacturing anything, but was making huge amounts of money from just buying pearls, sorting and packaging them before selling them to the top jewelers in the industry. This was very new to him as he remembered how much effort his late father and his workers put into the business before it could be just as successful. This taught him the very essence of working smart, so he took it upon himself to learn every business tactic he could from the pearl company. Everything changed in 1900 when Hans received a letter from his Swiss friend informing him of a job at Kuno Korten. Kuno Korten was the biggest watchmaking company at the time. He knew he would not be paid as much as he was already earning from the pearl business, but he wasted no time traveling to La Chorte de Fond to apply for the job. Learning from a company that exported pocket watches worth over a million Swiss francs every year was an opportunity of a lifetime one that Hans was not going to miss. His ability to speak English made him very valuable to the company, and he was immediately hired as a clerk. Aside from clerical duties, he was responsible for winding at least a hundred pocket watches every day. He could not only identify accurate watches, but also easily gain a huge insight into watchmaking without formal training. He worked at Kuno Koriton for only two years as his plans were interrupted when he had to leave and serve in the German army during the war. He was 22 when he was done with service and had gotten a new outlook on life. This time, he moved to England. He felt knowledgeable enough to start his own business and began to look for investors. At this time, while networking, he met Florence Francis May Crotty, whom he later married. Fortunately, his much older brother-in-law, Alfred James Davis, saw how passionate and confident he was and took a chance on him. Filsdorf and Davis Limited was created in 1905 as a result of his investment, a partnership that would subsequently become Rolex. They partnered with a Swiss watch company called Hermann Egler. They imported the Hermann pocket watches, repackaged them, and sold them at affordable rates. Within a short time, they had to open an office in Bern, Switzerland, to ease their operations. By 1914, the business was thriving, but Hans was not satisfied. At the time, pocket watches were the preferred accessory for telling time. Wristwatches were only worn by women because they were relatively smaller in size. Due to their small size, the wristwatches could only make very small movements, making them unable to always tell the precise time. Pocket watches were more detailed and more masculine because of their size. Hans had never liked the idea of pocket watches. As a man whose hands were always busy, he found it very inconvenient to always reach for the watch in his pocket before he could tell the time. He knew it would be difficult, but he was determined to change this phenomenon in his lifetime. He spent the next few years traveling around Europe to meet with different watchmakers to bring his dream to life. 
By 1908, he'd applied what he'd learned from his travels and released a couple of his own wristwatches. These pieces were already creating a buzz, and Hans knew it was time to rebrand. The current company name, Wilsdorf and David Limited, was too long and not catchy enough. Hans wanted a name that was easy to remember and pronounce, no matter the language. Ideally, the new name had to be just five letters, so it could fit in the dial of subsequent watches. It took Hans a very long time to decipher the perfect name. He consistently came up with thousands of possible alphabet combinations before he finally got Rolex. He immediately registered the Rolex name as a trademark. As expected, there was an increase in demand by the elite in society for these high-quality watches with fancy names. There was another war, and many businesses had to close down. However, this was a breakthrough for Rolex. The company received many orders because its wristwatches were easier and safer to use by soldiers in battle. However, this high point was short-lived because by the end of the war, the British economy became unfavorable for the company. There was a very significant increase in taxes for businesses that exported goods across international borders. Another challenge the company faced in England was that after the war, there was a sudden dislike for Germans. Local sales had slowed down just because it was owned by a German. Though he'd already trademarked the name Rolex, it wasn't until 1920 that the company name was officially changed to Rolex SA. For these reasons, Hans moved the company headquarters to Geneva, Switzerland. The Bayern office was still operating mainly as a manufacturing base. The watches would then be transferred to the headquarters so they could be verified before distribution. The famous five-star crown Rolex logo was trademarked and introduced in 1925, and it was at this time Hans began to set new goals for the company. He wanted to produce wristwatches with very tight cases, such that they would not be affected by dust, heat, or water. Later in 1926, Hans made the perfect watch. This new model was the Rolex Oyster. As intended, it had a very tight case that protected the small moving parts inside the watch. Even though the model was revolutionary, Hans was not in a hurry to release it to the world. The following year, he saw an opportunity, and he took it. Mercedes Glitzer, an English professional swimmer, was challenged to swim across the 20.5-mile body of the English Channel that separates England and France. Hans approached the swimmer and gave her an oyster wristwatch right before she dived into the water. To the amazement of everyone, the watch survived the swim in perfect condition. Hans immediately put up an ad for the Oyster wristwatch in the newspapers. Hans also ensured that every Rolex store displayed samples of the Oyster watch inside fishbowls. As expected, everybody wanted a piece of this wristwatch. Notably, his wife passed away in 1944, and as a result, he established the Wildsdorf Foundation. Before he eventually died in 1960, he transferred 100% ownership of Rolex to the foundation. This is why Rolex will never be sold or go public. Earlier in 1945, the date just was released. It was the first watch to display the date. In the 1950s, the Submariner and the Explorer were released. The GMT Master, which was the first watch to indicate two different time zones, was also released during this period. In 1963, the Cosmograph Daytona was released and had been the most desirable watch in the world. The Sea Dweller came in 1967. This watch can survive a thousand meters jump in the ocean. Ever since then, the Rolex pieces have kept on changing the game. In 2017, the most expensive Rolex watch, the Bayo Dai, sold for over $5 million. This is almost 20 times what it was sold for when it was first released in 2002. All these remarkable pieces are handmade and built in-house. Yes, all moving pieces of the Rolex watches are assembled by hand. Every watch is also made with 904L, which is the most expensive stainless steel in the world. Notably, it takes about a year to manufacture all the various parts and components of the watch, but once that's done, it takes only a few hours to assemble them together. From an orphan boy who had nothing but his books and the will to succeed, Hans Wildsdorf forged his own path and pioneered the watch industry we know today. His drive and passion for innovation ultimately helped him build this legacy.